everyone for coming out for the second afternoon of, of uh, talks. And um, again, look forward not only to a set of talks, but a little bit of a break for lots of conversation. And then we'll have a poster session with some food and drinks and all of that. But that uh, gives a chance to amplify some of the additional plant biology that's going on in the area. So an opportunity to meet some of the students and postdocs. Uh, and that will be the final part of our program this afternoon. Um, as many of you will know, there are relatively few botanists or plant scientists at Harvard University. And um, so I count us as very lucky to have great friends and colleagues in the neighborhood. You may have noticed that yesterday, Commissioner Friedman from Boston University uh, talked about uh, really putting the Yarmouth Arboretum on the map when it comes to using these collections to study phenology and, and, and climate change. And well, one from Boston University is good, two from Boston <laughs> University is even better. And I'd like to introduce Pam Templer, who is a professor at Boston University. Uh, and she has been working with the Arnold Arboretum on a very different set of projects. But again, very much focused on global change, uh, on a variety of things that have to do with geochemistry, uh, ecosystems, and, uh, well, I'm, I'm not going to say any more because, uh, but we're really so glad to have you here, Pam. And it's just a reminder that this isn't just a, a place for Harvard people. This is a place for anyone in the world to come use these collections, this landscape, and this urban situated green space in unique ways that you couldn't do anywhere else. So, Pam, please. Well, Ned, thank you so much for that introduction, and thanks to all of you for being here today. Before I jump into my talk, I'm gonna start in an unusual way for me to, with my acknowledgements, really to thank the Arnold Arboretum, because I've been faculty at Boston University since 2005, and I've felt welcomed here at the Arboretum in large part because of you, Ned. Thank you so much for all you do to support scientists who are based here at the Arboretum as well as in the area. So thank you for that. It's really the people that make it work. The staff here at the Arboretum are amazing. Many of you are on this room, in this room and I appreciate it. And then of course the living collections. I couldn't do the work that I'm gonna share with you today without them. So I also just want to acknowledge, since this was part of the great tradition yesterday to talk about our past, my very first paper as a faculty at Boston University was based on work here at the Arnold Arboretum. And it was thanks to Peter Del Tredige for making that work happen. Thank you to Richard Premack for initially recommending that I even work here at the Arboretum. So it takes a village, that's for sure. So what I'm gonna to talk to you about today is forest dynamics in rural areas, using that as a backdrop to give the foundation for my work. And then I'm gonna share with you today, talk about our work here at the Arboretum and elsewhere, looking at atmospheric deposition in the greater Boston area. I'll put that into context for rates of deposition and patterns around the globe. And then I'll sum up with some comparisons of urban to rural ecosystems. So what's going on around the world? You all know that human activities are impacting natural ecosystems, whether it's through climate change, air pollution, land use change, or introduced pests. Our lab looks at all of these things, but for brevity today, I'm just gonna share a story with you about our work on air pollution and land use change, specifically urbanization. And so many of you here also know, but just in case you don't, that human activities like the burning of fossil fuels at electrical power plants, the driving of cars, as well as agricultural activities like the synthesis and application of fertilizers, and planting of leguminous crops are all leading to doubling of atmospheric rates of nitrogen fixation. And in essence, that's leading to increased emissions of ammonia and NOx to the atmosphere. Well, what goes up must come down. We know that as these gaseous emissions go up to the atmosphere, they often come back down in the form of atmospheric deposition, which is just a fancy word for precipitation like rain, um, snow, fog water, as well as dry deposition in the form of dust and particulates. Well, as this nitrogen gets deposited onto ecosystems, it could actually fertilize growth since nitrogen is often an, a limiting element for many organisms, and it can increase rates of primary productivity. However, we can get too much of a good thing. If you add too much nitrogen to a system, it could saturate the biological demand for that element, and we start to see lots of negative effects happening. So nitrogen saturation around the globe has been associated with increases in nitrogen leaching, release of nitrous oxide, which is a greenhouse gas, reduced forest productivity, acidification of stream water, eutrophication or algal blooms, as well as terrible health effects like blue baby syndrome, which is basically stillbirths. We have a really good understanding of rates and patterns of deposition in the United States in large part because of the National Atmospheric Deposition Program. 
It's a nationwide network of sites. All of the black dots represent sites in the network. Um, and as you can see, they're spread across the United States, but they're measured primarily in rural areas. And that's to provide for regional and continental scale understanding of atmospheric deposition. And so from this network, we know that in the United States, rates of deposition, especially nitrate, have been declining um, in large part because of the Clean Air Act amendments of 1990. So we know the patterns of nitrogen deposition went up quite a bit, they came back down. We also know that other changes are happening in the environment. You probably all know this curve, it's known as the Keeling Curve, that human activities like burning of fossil fuels and deforestation are leading to the increase in carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. This, of course, is leading to rising global temperatures, increased frequency of extreme weather events like droughts, heat waves, and a shrinking snowpack. And it's really important to understand how all of these changes are impacting our forest ecosystems because we know around the globe when they take up carbon that removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And on a global basis, we estimate that carbon dioxide uptake by forests can offset our greenhouse gas emissions by about 30%. So just in case you're not familiar with this, just the idea is that as long as carbon dioxide uptake via photosynthesis is greater than respiration, we can consider ecosystems to be net carbon sinks. This has been in the news quite a bit. Um, we call this nature-based solutions. Um, it was just quite very heavily um, covered in COP26 in Glasgow, Scotland. What came out of it was the Glasgow Leaders Declaration on Forests and Land Use. More locally here in Massachusetts, we have the 2050 Decarbonization Roadmap, which really takes advantage of nature-based solutions to get CO2 out of our atmosphere. Now that's mostly looking at rural forest ecosystems. We also know we have lots of nature-based solutions here in cities. As Ned did yesterday so eloquently, we know that trees in cities provide a lot of benefits to humans. Um, they can calm traffic, they reduce road rage, they reduce noise, they improve drainage, um, they actually help human health, as Ned talked about yesterday, through cooling temperatures, which is really important with extreme heat events in summer. They do this through shading and evapotranspiration. And of course, they filter our air and reduce air pollution, whether it's the form of carbon dioxide as well as particulates and ozone. So some people estimate that if you plant a tree in a city that at a cost of roughly $250 to $600, you can get in return about $90,000 in benefits. But it's important to understand that all the global changes I talked to you about might actually affect the ability of us to use nature-based solutions because they might have negative effects on the functioning of either our rural forests or, or our urban trees. So as I mentioned, we know that atmospheric CO2 and temperatures are rising. Um, we know that atmospheric nitrogen deposition is declining. And so one thing this has led to is this phenomenon that's getting increasing attention in the literature known as nitrogen oligotrophication, which is a mouthful. All that means is that many changes in the environment are leading to increased demand for nitrogen and other nutrients by vegetation, but it's not being met by supply. And so we see evidence for this in northern hardwood forests. We did this paper looking at data from long-term records at Hubbard Brook in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. We did this by looking at a global analysis of isotopic values um, from around the world. And more recently, we just published this paper a couple weeks ago in Science that provides evidence, causes, and consequences of declining nitrogen availability in terrestrial ecosystems. So I'll just give you a little bit more details about this study. We compiled data from over 43,000 records of foliage in terms of nitrogen concentrations and natural abundance 15N isotopes. These were all terrestrial plants with data from 1980 to the year 2017, and you could see the sites around the globe here. I'll just show you a couple graphs here from this study. This graph here is showing you foliar 15N values over time um, here in this graph. And in case you're not familiar with natural abundance isotopes of nitrogen and how we can use them, the fact that we see this decline over time suggests that over time the plants are not only taking up less nitrogen, but that, that's coupled with both decreased nitrogen availability and nitrogen losses from the forest. We also see this in simple records of foliar nitrogen concentrations. Um, as you can see here, foliar nitrogen on the y-axis with years on the x-axis. This has led to some headlines that we see in the news, like why some places on Earth actually lack nitrogen. This is a big change if you've been following the nitrogen story. It used to be all about excess nitrogen and acid rain, and now the media is jumping on the fact that we're running out of nitrogen. 
And this is important, it has implications globally because if nitrogen is in fact getting to be in more limited supply, that could constrain the ecosystem functions that we all rely upon. So for example, their ability to store carbon, if they're more and more limited by these elements, they might not take it up as much, they might not be able to cool local temperatures like Boston and other cities, and they might not be able to filter our air and water. But this is the big but, <laughs> the big however. All of the data I've shown you so far and all of this discussion in the literature has really focused on rural ecosystems. And I think there's no disagreement that nitrogen availability is going down relative to demand around the globe. But I think it's really important that we not ignore ecosystems like those here at the Arnold Arboretum because they're really important for all the reasons um, we got to hear about yesterday. So now what I wanna do is share with you some work that we've been doing in the greater Boston area. And then like I said, I'll expand this um, to bigger scale. So you might ask, why examine nitrogen in urban ecosystems? We know that urban areas like Boston represent less than 2% of global land area, but they're also the majority of greenhouse gas emissions to the atmosphere. And we also know that worldwide, cities represent more than 50% of the human population and it's growing. So again, Ned talked to us about the use of botanical gardens and arboretums to benefit human health. If we don't study these ecosystems where the people are living, we might be missing some of those connections. And also compared to rural areas, we simply lack a deep understanding of nitrogen and other elemental biogeochemistry in urban areas. So it's not to say that there's been no past studies. I'll give you a couple examples here. But most of our past studies on urban biogeochemistry have taken an understandably a somewhat simple approach. Um, so for example, in this one study, the scientists used just two sites, one in an urban area and a companion role study. We've done that too, so I'm not trying to, to criticize. I'm just saying this was some of the early work. And here they showed higher rates of deposition in the city of Baltimore compared to a nearby rural area. We, this is um, some of our work from Preeti Rao, who is a postdoc, and what she did is she set up sites going on the left side um, in Boston, oops, I forgot I had a pointer here, um, here in Boston on the left side over to central Massachusetts at Harvard Forest, and you can see when she measured total rates of deposition, they were higher in the urban area compared to that in central Massachusetts. However, what we don't know is what's going on in the cities themselves. And so if we want to have an understanding of what's happening in urban areas, it's really important to understand the dynamics that are happening in cities themselves. So we asked this question, how heterogeneous is atmospheric deposition of nitrogen in urban ecosystems and what controls it? So again, we did this work in Boston um, right here and the Arnold Arboretum was one of our sites. Um, what we did first is we set up two National Atmospheric Deposition Program sites. If any of you want to see one, one is directly behind this building on Weld, Weld, yeah, Weld Hill. Um, and one of them is at Boston University on a rooftop. And so while it would be ideal to set up multiple NADP sites across the greater Boston area, that's just simply not possible logistically or financially. And so what we did is at the sites where we had NADP collectors, we also put out what are known as ion exchange resin collectors. These are lower cost, they take less labor, you can leave them in the field for approximately six weeks, you bring them back to the lab, um, and basically what happens is there's a funnel at the top and all rainwater or snow that comes through here, the ions get charged, they're charged and they get stripped out, you bring it back to the lab, you extract it, and then you can measure how much either nitrogen, phosphorus, whatever you're measuring accumulated over time. And so to find out whether this was a method that we could actually utilize in multiple sites, we compared our data for, from the NADP2 sites, so here at the Arnold Arboretum as well as at Boston University, with the ion exchange resin collectors. So the NADP site collector is here and our ion exchange collector is here. On the x-axis is just, you can see, an entire period going from June to October with inorganic nitrogen deposition on the y-axis. The gray dots just represent the cumulative amount of nitrogen we measured at the NADP wet deposition collector, and the black squares represent what we measured cumulatively in the ion exchange resin collectors. So this gave us confidence that yes, in fact, we could use these throughout the greater Boston area to get a much bigger amount of replication in our study. So Steve Giacchina, a PhD student in my lab who did a lot of work here at the Arboretum, set up three ion exchange resin collectors in each of 15 sites spread across the greater Boston area. Um, he was doing this to measure throughfall, which is just a measure of atmospheric inputs that come through the canopy. We originally wanted to do many more sites out in the open, but in a place like Boston with a lot of tree canopy, that was hard to find. So to keep things constant, he'd put them all underneath hardwood tree canopies. 
So these, this is the same figure I showed you before that goes all the way from Boston out to Harvard Forest, and I'm gonna overlay Steve's data here. These black triangles represent the 15 sites across the greater Boston area. And at, as you can see, if you took the average of this, it's actually higher than our rural most site. But what surprised us the most is this great amount of variability. Again, most studies, like what we had done in the past, had just one urban site. So depending on where you put that urban site, you might come, from, you might come with very different conclusions. And so this begs the question, what causes that variability? So these are all the 15 sites that Steve had around the greater Boston area. In case you're not familiar, this is Boston Harbor and this is the Charles River. Um, and what he found is that in general, that we have five times higher rates of deposition compared to the rural most sites out at Harvard Forest, but that within the greater Boston area, rates of deposition vary between three and four fold. So of course we were interested in knowing what caused that variability. So the first thing I'm going to show you is a graph that has NOx emissions on the x-axis and nitrate deposition on the y, and then I'll have the same format for ammonia emissions and then ammonia deposition on the y-axis. Now the dogma before this study was often that most deposition comes in the prevailing winds, it comes from regional sources, and around here comes mostly from the Midwest from agricultural activities and power plant emissions of burning of fossil fuels. But what we found here is that when we looked at NOx emissions from tailpipes, so this is using the EPA MOVES model to figure out rough to calculate how much NOx came from tailpipes within the 250 meters of each of our sites, that's within an x-axis, and then we paired that with our measures of nitrate deposition, we actually found a pretty strong relationship. And again, the white circles are that whole urban to rural gradient, the black triangles are just in the greater Boston area. When I do the same thing with ammonia, you get slightly different slopes for the urban and rural sites, um, but the same trend that ammonia emissions from tailpipes is highly correlated with ammonium deposition, suggesting that we actually have local sources of emissions that create deposition here in the greater Boston area, hitting the trees here at the Arnold Arboretum. But what about other unaccounted atmospheric inputs? Most people who study biogeochemistry in cities tend to focus on nitrogen. But we, of course, know there are other compounds and elements that are in our atmospheric deposition. So Steve went out and found nine new sites and measured ammonium and nitrate again, just to corroborate our earlier findings. But he also added measurements of phosphorus as well as organic nitrogen and carbon. So I have just one data slide here to put it all together. Um, and what he did in these nine sites is in each of them, he had a paired collector that was out in the open, which we call bulk deposition, and then another collector that was beneath the canopy to measure through fall. And in all cases, whether he's measuring total phosphorus, nitrate, ammonium, organic nitrogen, or organic carbon, he sees higher rates of deposition and through fall than he does in bulk deposition, showing elevated deposition due to tree canopy processes. Now what we then did is we scaled this up to the entire city of Boston. This is just one example of a neighborhood in Boston where you see green is where you have tree canopy. The darker the green means that the tree canopy is above soil, and the lighter green means it's above pavement. And so if you look down on the city of Boston, about 25% of our city is covered in tree canopy. Our results show that having a tree canopy doubles inputs of both nitrogen and triples inputs of phosphorus. That's, of course, compared to bulk inputs. Now, if all of our tree canopies were above soil, like they are here at the Arboretum, we wouldn't be so worried because many of the biological processes happening in soil, whether it's from microbes or roots, would take care of that and likely internally recycle those nutrients, and we'd see relatively small fluxes up to the atmosphere or into our nearby waterways. But in those areas, like 26% of the area that has tree canopy in Boston, we know actually has pavement beneath them. And what that suggests is that as the tree canopy amplifies atmospheric inputs, if you only have cement and not microbes and plant roots able to access those nutrients, we're likely to see increased gaseous losses and movement into nearby waterways. And so big unknown that we're working on right now is how vegetation and soils interact in cities to either retain or lose nitrogen, phosphorus, and carbon to nearby waterways and back to the atmosphere. But what about other cities around the globe? So now I'm just gonna share with you a story that Steve Ticina also did looking at deposition um, around the globe. Now that we showed that it was elevated in cities here in the US, like in Boston, we wanted to know if this pattern could be seen elsewhere as well. So Steve published his paper, Hot Spots of Nitrogen Deposition in the World's Urban Areas, and he did this using a global data synthesis. So all of the blue circles represent sites around the globe. 
He used data from 174 publications with data spanning 40 years. This here just shows you the cumulative number of studies over time that study urban nitrogen deposition. So back in the 70s and 80s, very few studies looked at deposition in cities, but you can see this steady climb um, in the number of papers over time. However, to our knowledge, nobody had put these data together, um, and so it was exciting to see Steve compile all of this information. So what did he find? Um, here, I'm gonna show you four graphs that all have the same format. Um, it's a meta-analysis, so we have log response ratio on the x-axis, and what it means is anything to the right of the zero means that urban sites have higher rates of deposition than their rural counterpart, and vice versa. And so here I'm showing you dry deposition, and because the value and its 95% confidence intervals are to the right of that line, that means rates of dry deposition in cities are generally higher than their rural counterparts. That's true for wet deposition, so that's rain and snow, um, as well as bulk deposition and throughfall. So we see this consistent pattern around the globe that if we only measure deposition in rural areas, we're really missing these hot spots of potential inputs of nutrients to different ecosystems. But the last short story I'll share with you is how these elevated rates of nutrient inputs that come from the sky might be affecting our ability of vegetation in cities to sequester carbon. So now what I'm gonna do is end with a short story comparing urban to rural ecosystems, looking at interactions between nitrogen, carbon, and other elements. So I'm just showing you photos here of our collaborators on this project. Um, in this project, we call it the Urban New England Project, or UNE. We have eight sites, including here at the Arnold Arboretum, um, along an urban to rural gradient, so urban here in Boston, out to Harvard Forest. At each site, we have measurements that go from the forest interior, and, and it looks just like a line of trees, but it's actually an intact forest. Um, and we have trees 90 meters from the forest edge, 60, 30, 20, and 10. And then we have forest edges that either abut a road or a field. At all of these sites, we measure multiple things like carbon dioxide, ozone, NOx, which I don't have here, as well as nitrogen deposition and particulate matter, and we look at how all of these changes have the potential to affect net carbon storage. So I'm just gonna show you two slides here with data from this study. Um, they're all, gonna, all the graphs are gonna have the same format where the x-axis is distance from the forest edge, so zero is right at the edge of the forest, all the way to 90 meters into the interior. These are rates of net mineralization that Steve Karen, who's showing a poster this afternoon, so please come, um, collected. And he used the buried bag method where you just incubate soils in the field for a month at a time and you do this over and over again. And this gives you a measure of nitrogen availability for the trees to take up. And so what we found here is that especially in the interior, these were not significantly different. But in the forest interior, we see greater rates of net mineralization in the urban than the rural sites, suggesting that nitrogen availability is higher in the urban sites compared to the rural ones. This translates directly into foliar nitrogen. So this is a picture here at the Arboretum. Um, using a pole pruner, the students collected leaves, measure the nitrogen as a measure of nitrogen uptake, and again, see greater rates of nitrogen uptake in the urban compared to the rural stands. Another um, set of data I'm gonna show is from Sarah Garvey, who's also showing a poster this afternoon, so please come. Um, here we have distance from the edge again, but in this case we have soil carbon dioxide, which is a measure of respiration. You can think of this as just losses of carbon dioxide from the soils to the atmosphere. So more carbon lost means less carbon stored. Um, and what she found is that in this case, it's the opposite of nitrogen, that rates of soil respiration were higher in the rural sites compared to that of the urban sites. So more losses in rural compared to urban. And we attribute this to differences in soil temperature, moisture, as well as other factors we measured. In the urban sites, the soils are warmer, they're also drier, which might have contributed to decreased rates of microbial respiration, perhaps root respiration as well. But what this means is that we're seeing um, greater carbon storage in the or urban forest than we expected. And this is in conjunction with work of Lucy Hutira's lab where they measured actually greater rates of carbon uptake by the urban trees compared to the rural ones. And so together it led to these headlines. This was Sarah Garvey's paper I just showed you. Um, things like urban forests may be storing more carbon dioxide than they emit, city trees suck up more carbon than we thought, forest edges store more carbon than expected. And so the point here is just that we can't ignore our urban forests. They're getting more nutrients and they're also storing a lot of carbon. And so now I just wanna close it out with just a couple summary slides um, to think about what's happening with our rural and urban ecosystems around the globe. And so this is what I think is happening. Um, in the order I presented it, in our rural forests, it seems like we're hitting a stage of oligotrophication. 
where we actually, following periods of really high nitrogen deposition, we've come down, and so we have lower nitrogen availability, decreased foliar N as a measure of N uptake. I didn't show you data for this, but lower losses of nitrogen through gaseous losses and leaching, and perhaps this might be constraining the ability of our forests in rural areas to take up carbon. That's in contrast to what we consider eutrophic ecosystems, whether you're in a city or an agricultural area, where we seem to have increased nitrogen availability, higher foliar nitrogen, gaseous losses, leaching, and we see greater carbon sequestration. And so putting this all together, thinking about in terms of rural versus urban, is that in rural ecosystems, atmospheric deposition is declining, um, just as demand for nitrogen is going up by our trees, and that nitrogen oligotrophication might be constraining the responses of forests to rising temperatures and CO2. That's in contrast to places like the Arnold Arboretum, where atmospheric deposition is high, it's variable, it's amplified by tree canopies, and it seems to be feeding carbon storage in our urban forests. So that's my talk about the science. I just have one sliver of a thank you, is that I just wanna say that at the Arnold Arboretum, one of my favorite things about being an associate here is being invited to talk to the public. So I've participated in tree mobs, lots of K through 12 training of teachers and students, and honestly, those are some of my favorite days of the year. I love coming here, and I thank everyone, Anna and Faye and others who invite me to do this. And often, you know, Jenna Rindy's in here, one of my students. The students love it as well. And so it's just a wonderful exchange that I hope continues between the scientists and the public that come here to the Arboretum. So just finally, I'll thank all the students and people here at the Arboretum who made this happen. Um, as well as the funding. Um, I love the idea of having perhaps meetings among scientists so we can all share our methods. If any of you want to come to our sites of the Arboretum and measure tree physiology and xylem and phloem and flower structure, you, it would be wonderful. Um, so please reach out. My email's there um, or talk to me at the break. It'd be great to connect. Do we have time for a question? I feel better about our trees, by the way. Now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. Great talk. Is there, is there any evidence that nitrogen is actually constraining tree growth? Um, yeah, so interestingly, we've always known that nitrogen is a limiting element in our temperate ecosystems. For a long time, we saw evidence that nitrogen was going up, so both increases in foliar nitrogen, increases in nitrogen losses. People have done fertilization experiments who show that if you add nitrogen, the plants grow more, which is the evidence that they are still nitrogen limited. But we are seeing a huge decrease in losses. So whether you look at long-term records of deposition or streamwater nitrogen or soil nitrogen or soil rates of mineralization, any long-term records like at Harvard Forest and Hubbard Brook show that the nitrogen availability is going down and it's constraining growth. But the inference is it's constraining. Is there, besides the Oh, I see what you mean. Sorry. So it depends on where you look. So part of my Buller Fellowship with Missy Holbrook this year and Jonathan Thompson is to look at just that. So we know at Harvard Forest, it's still a positive net carbon sink, and that sink is growing. At a place like Harvard Brook, the data so far suggests that the forest has stopped growing. Of course, you have individual trees growing and dying, um, but it suggests a very site-specific constraint on whether it's still a carbon sink or not. Great question. That is an excellent question I do not know the answer to. We, we know the tree species are changing a lot. How much we can attribute it to changing inputs? I don't know. I'd love to know here at the Arboretum if you're seeing a response to that. Because, of course, red oak is doing well at Harvard Forest. It's starting to invade Hubbard Brook. We're seeing so many pest species coming in and changing. Ash is about to die at Hubbard Brook because the emerald ash borer just arrived. So it's hard for me to disentangle if it's the nutrients or the pests or something else. But you might know here at the Arboretum. No, I don't know. I, I, <laughs> I don't know, but I, I had a question though. Yeah. It, it comes back to the fact that your work has so many implications for policy. Um, when you think about tree planting, does this? I mean, is there interaction with uh, you know, cities to talk about you know what you do with soils around trees? Because again, mm -hmm. you might not want all that runoff. Mm -hmm. You might want to still get the carbon sequestration, but typically every pit is you know basically this big around, and everything everything's going to be runoff, and mm -hmm. yet you could do things where you had 
uh, more expo exposed soil. So I'm curious whether you have begun to interact in, within Boston or elsewhere mm -hmm. on, on these very direct implications. Well, great. I'm glad you asked that. This is a really, I'll tell a really quick story. So Carl Spector, the commissioner for the environment in Boston, Lucy Hutier and I went downtown. We showed him our nitrogen results. We're like, you know, Carl, look at these results. He's like, nitrogen, nitrogen, whatever. What about phosphorus? We, we weren't planning to measure phosphorus at all. So we went back to BU, went to Steve and said, do you still have the samples? Can we analyze them for phosphorus? Because in Boston, at least, Boston, uh, phosphorus is the limiting element that really affects eutrophication in Boston Harbor. So that's why he cared about it. But we have been in discussion with him about like exactly that, that you can't just plant them in this tiny thing and then have cement under the canopy. You're just gushing in more inputs. Um, but it, it's interesting that they do seem receptive to that. Well, that's great because they are obsessed with phosphorus, not as they having any solutions at hand, but but yeah. they're under order to exactly drop the phosphorus, so they're going to focus on that. Uh, yeah, Michael. Uh, so in the graph that has a little red dot and it sort of goes up and down, nitrogen. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I didn't catch how far to the left your time was. That was about 1980 when the NADP network started. So deposition had been going up for a long time because right. of the burning so, of fossil so fuels. Mm -hmm. Is there any sense of what the nitrogen deposition would be, you know, pre-100 years or so? Yeah, so people make estimates of that based on lots of different things like sediment cores because we didn't have collectors back then. Um, but it was thought to be much lower, but the decrease in foliar 15N that people are using as an index of oligotrophication appears to have predated for sure when the deposition went down. So that can't be the sole driver of the pattern. Great. Thank okay. you so much, Pam. Thank okay. you. Wonderful. We're going to go from the entire Earth as a sort of interconnected set of ecosystems to individual cones, I believe, on the conifer. Yeah, I think so. And this is wonderful. So these are the scales that we cross right here at the Colorado <laughs> region. It is really scale. Oh, sorry, that was a fun. Thank you. Anyway, uh, it's great. Andrew has come from afar, and uh, we're really glad to, to have him. Uh, he's been at Stanford University on the faculty for the last. Well, you said two and a half years, yeah, sort of yeah. just before the pandemic. So maybe, maybe he hasn't seen some of his colleagues yet. But uh, <laughs> he was at Brown University for many years mm -hmm. before moving uh, to Stanford. But he's had a long history here at the Arlo Arboretum uh, and in, in general in looking at the evolution of conifers as well as other groups. And uh, we're, I'm looking forward well, to it. thank you. And thank you for having me. It's nice to be, nice to be back here. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to talk about today is the development of conifer cones uh, and how that might influence uh, patterns of their morphological evolution. And a lot of this work is by a uh, former postdoc of mine and postdoc of the Arnold Arboretum, Juan Lasada, who started out here and then was a postdoc with me for a few years, but he was still stationed here at the Arnold Arboretum during that time. So he had access to all these wonderful collections and all the wonderful equipment here at Weld Hill to do a lot of this work. So I think when most people think of blooming botanic gardens and arboreta in the, in the spring, you think of flowering plants and trees and things like that. But as uh, Ned has done a good job of promoting, there are also conifers that, that color the landscape here uh, during this time of the year. In particular, something like a, a spruce here has a kind of cone that you might not sort of immediately think of as your typical conifer cone. It's not this kind of drab, woody uh, thing. It's actually uh, quite delicate in many ways and, and red. Uh, and this, is, this reflects the changes that you see in conifer cones in general over their lifespan. They're not always these kind of woody uh, things that we know, uh, but they change uh, quite a bit over their development, over their ontogeny, as they perform different functional roles uh, for the plant. So of course they'll start out in bud and then they'll, they'll emerge and then they'll facilitate pollination. And then at some point after that they will uh, mature seeds and provide protection for the developing seeds. And then at some point they have to open up and release these seeds. And so conifer cones change uh, quite a bit in size and shape over their development as their function changes. And, and I'm interested in this in part because I'm interested in, in general, uh, the evolution of, of morphological diversity, what drives morphological diversification. And I often use uh, conifer cones as just a sampling of some diversity of conifers to try and understand what, what drives these patterns and processes. Uh, and in general, I, I kind of mix phylogenetic methods with, with the fossil record, with living uh, taxa, to try and understand uh, how form and function uh, influence the evolution of of this kind of stuff, of this dis, uh, disparate morphologies. And the short answer really is that it was animals after the Triassic that are responsible largely for this kind of morphological diversity that we see, 
But today I want to talk about how specific patterns of development in conifer cones might also influence patterns of morphology that we see. And just to remind everyone, so we're kind of on the same page here, plant reproductive structures, particularly seed plant reproductive structures, have kind of an amazing change of form and function over their development. So these structures, something that starts out like a flower, has functions in pollination. It, it moves pollen, it releases pollen, it captures pollen. But after that's done, it has to protect developing seeds from, from pests, from, cl from climate, from things like that. And then at some point, it has to release these seeds, whether through animal dispersal or through just opening up and releasing seeds into the air. And so it has the sequence of disparate functions that it performs over its development. And uh, you know, plants aren't alone in this. Juvenile animals also often have different functions that they perform. Uh, as they make their way to being an adult, but I would argue that when the functions are really disparate in a lot of these things, you see sort of wholesale body changes because they have these squishy, malleable cells that they can just sort of remodel. Whereas we don't use words typically, to my knowledge, like larvae and metamorphosis in plants uh, because these structures are basically using the same set of parts. The, the fruit of an orange is, is present in the ovary of the flower. They use the same basic set of parts that are established early in development to perform all these different functions. When some kind of change in shape is needed, it's basically this additive growth that's, that plants do where they just sort of proliferate and differentiate cells in parts that are already present. And so presumably this could influence the patterns of diversification, the patterns of morphology that you see, because if you only have a certain set of parts that you're starting with in the lineage, presumably there's only some kinds of structures you can make as you mature. So people have bred a lot of different kinds of citrus, but none of these things look like pineapples or, or blackberries or something like that because they start with a certain kind set of parts. So, but you could also imagine that perhaps selection on some later stage of development, like for uh, different mechanisms of seed dispersal, could actually sort of influence the types of, of ontogeny, the types of developmental sequences that are present even from the beginning. So you can imagine if there's some need for a certain set of parts uh, to facilitate seed dispersal, maybe those parts are present all the way at the beginning of development, even if they're not needed for pollination. I don't think that occurs very frequently. We'll see an example where you can kind of argue that, um, but, but it's a possibility. So just to get now to conifers in particular, I'm going to be talking about the pinaceae, the pine family. And here's a basic cone structure and the basic sort of functional ontogeny, if you will, uh, the functions through development of a, of a conifer seed cone, a pinaceae seed cone. So early in pollination, you have an axis here, and you have these reiterated cone scale units, which consists of a, a foliage-like bract, a leaf-like bract. And that subtends what's called an ovuliferous scale, which is widely believed to be a shoot system that's been modified to bear a seed at this point, the ovule, the unpollinated seed. And at pollination, there are little gaps or cracks between these scales that allow pollen to be blown in from the air. These are all wind pollinated. And so we'll see some videos, pollen kind of jostles around and, and falls through these, or is blown through these cracks. It basically lands on these little arms that are the opening of the ovules that will become the seed. But after that's done, the ovuliferous scale swells and, and through large, sort of large scale intercalary growth, it swells shut and it closes the cone off to protect these seeds as they develop for anywhere from several months to several years in some, in some taxa. But if you're closing the seeds up, you also have to open to release them at some point. And so these scales eventually flex in many taxa. We'll see it's not always true. But the scales stereotypically flex apart uh, and then release the seeds. So we have this developmental sequence, this functional ontogeny of changes through development going from closed in bud to the cone is open up pollination to close during maturation and open again at, seed, at cone maturity. And so to return to this basic question of, of how function and development interact to influence the evolution of morphological diversity. Of course, the answer is they interact in many different ways, but I'm going to give you a few examples in conifers and pinaceae uh, of how they could interact in specific ways to, to shape patterns of morphology. So the first thing I'll talk about is here at pollination. So I'll talk about how variation in the rate at which these cones develop, the rate at which these bracts and ovular for scales are, are formed, uh, might generate morphological diversity where you might not expect to see it in these wind pollinated uh, things. So this is based on an observation that I'm sure I'm not the first to notice, but I had a long time ago, which is that when you look at a couple different genera of pinaceae, here's a fir and here's a spruce, at the time of pollination, the cones look superficially a little bit similar. 
they have these kind of leaf-like looking scales um, that form the cone, and there's gaps between them through which pollen can, can flow. But they're actually not made of the same parts entirely. The part that you see, the, the most prominent part in a fir, is the bract, so that's that larger structure. The alveoliferous scale is not very well developed at this particular stage. The opposite is true in a spruce, where the, it's the alveoliferous scale that is the larger, bigger part that you see. The bract is pretty poorly developed. Now, after pollination, in all taxa of Pinaceae, it's the alveoliferous scale that takes over and swells and, and grows and proliferates and, and shuts the cone. But what we wanted to look at was this exact pattern of cell proliferation, proliferation and differentiation. How exactly are they uh, forming these two disparate, functionally or structurally disparate types of cones at pollination? And then what kinds of patterns of development result in this similar structure later? So Juan sampled cones that were growing here in the, in the garden uh, from a fir species and a spruce species. And this is a, a sort of a standard uh, anatomical work. We fixed and embedded specimens. It's actually fairly difficult. It's challenging technically because these get pretty large at the time of pollination to be resin embedded and fixed. Uh, but Juan is a, is a master at doing this. And so he spent months trying to fix these things um, and then section them. And then we quantified changes basically in cell size and shape uh, to basically record patterns of, of cell development proliferation. So let's look at some early cones and buds. So these things make uh, seed cones the season before in the late summer and they overwinter in bud. And what you'll see throughout this is just that spruces develop more quickly uh, than firs. So all of them show this basic ontogenetic pattern of bract is developed first, then the ovuliferous scale develops. The bract matures first and then the ovuliferous scale matures. And so in these early cones you don't even see an ovuliferous scale in a fir. You just see the bract primordium. Whereas in a spruce, you see the ovuliferous scale at axillary here to the bract. So one thing that was surprising to me is just how much growth occurs over winter in the bud in development. So these are buds right before bud break in early April. But if you look in December or in February, you'll see actually quite a bit of differentiation in growth is occurring even in the depths of winter. But here you'll see that the ovuliferous scale now, this little red nub, is here. The bracts are, are more well developed, and what you'll notice is these are stained for polysaccharides, and the bracts are loaded with, with sugars, which will basically be sites of, of cell expansion um, as these things develop. In the spruce, on the other hand, you have your ovulifer scale and your bract, but what you notice about these bracts is they're very light colored. These are basically fully developed, they're sort of fully vacuoled. Uh, these aren't going to do any more development, these bracts are basically done. And when you look at pollination itself, you see a dramatic expansion in the size uh, of the bract in the fir, whereas it stays the same size in the spruce, and it's the ovuliferous scale that's growing quickly. So it's just the simple patterns of proliferation and uh, differentiation and expansion that you'd expect to see in any kind of plant. But it's happening faster in general in firs or in, in spruces, and that's resulting in more of an ovuliferous scale. So, you can quantify this. This is just looking at the cell area in a bract or the ovuliferous scale as a, sort of a relative fraction of how big it will eventually become. You can see that the spruce cells mature earlier in a bract, whereas the bract is just maturing prior to pollination uh, and going through. And so actually after pollination, the ovuliferous scales will crush all of them uh, in, both, in both taxa. Whereas in the ovuliferous scale in a spruce, it matures, has this little burst of maturation and development right prior to pollination to create this kind of structure that we see. Now, the question that we had was, okay, well, they make these different forms. Uh, are they actually doing anything differently? They're both wind pollinated. Um, are they, is one of these better for wind pollination? It's kind of hard to imagine that it would be. But there is an idea uh, from some uh, wind tunnel work in the 80s that there might be some small changes in the kind of fluid dynamics of these cones that might be species dependent. So different morphologies might generate different kinds of wind currents going through these the cones that might trap pollen grains in a different kind of way. I didn't, we didn't investigate that directly, but you'll see if these videos, if you can see the resolution of these here, they don't really look like that's what's happening. It looks like pollen grains are just hitting these things. So these are a fir cone and a spruce cone in a wind tunnel. We put a batch of pollen in the wind tunnel and just videoed it going through. And we tried different combinations of things. We tried spruce pollen with fir cones and vice versa. We tried pine pollen. None of it makes much of a difference because as you'll see, they really just hit the cone and jostle around. So in the spruce here, you can start to see some things hitting it. There's gaps between the scales here, these bracts. 
pollen grains are just hitting it and they're just jostling around. And what they're doing is they're going, they're working their way inside the cone, blown by the wind, and they're getting to the base of the scales where these seeds are. The seeds have these little openings on them, these little arms that hang down, and there's little liquid droplets on those arms, and they just stick to this like, like flypaper. So they're just blowing through the cone kind of irregularly, and they just get stuck on the ovules because they release these little droplets. Spruce is basically the same way where you just start to see these pollen grains just kind of jostling around, hitting the things, bouncing off, um, and some fraction that end up inside the cone. So it's very difficult to say, to prove that these things are functionally identical, that there's no difference between these things. But in any way that we could look at it, and you'll see, quantify it, they don't seem to be substantially different in their ability to collect pollen grains. So what Juan did is he took off all these scales, we counted up pollen grains on the adaxial or upper surface and the abaxial or lower surface. This is just a, a reference picture. These, these data are, are basically a heat map generated for pooling all the scales that we looked at. And this is just kind of for reference. What you see is that in a natural cone that was collected just here in the Arnold, and then we pulled the scales off to see where the pollen grains were, or whether we use different wind speeds to try and different, get some sense of what variation that might lead to, you see that pollen is just always collected around this area, the micropile near the opening of the ovule. And so in spruces or in firs, and as I said, if you use different kinds of pollen with each of them, you always end up with pollen just right around where it's supposed to be near the ovule. Um, it doesn't seem like there's any obvious difference between these things. And if you look at kind of a broader phylogenetic picture, there's just a lot of variation in pinaceae. These are different pinaceae genera um, with their crown ages here, estimated crown ages. Whether one is bigger, whether the Bracter or ovulifer scale is bigger than the other, it's just kind of variable and it's kind of genus specific. So it doesn't seem obviously to be related to any ecological or environmental features. It looks like it's just a property of genera. And what we think probably happened is that when Pinaceae were radiating in the late Jurassic early Cretaceous, it just had a lot of variation in the rate at which these cones developed, whether the Bract emerged or developed first and stopped, and at what point in the ovulifer scale development you're at when pollination kind of uh, intrudes in this whole developmental process. And that just generated a range of variability in what was more mature at the pollination stage. And when these things split and diverge, maybe there was some functional reason back then, but they've just been basically stuck in that way ever since then. Um, and so perhaps we have this kind of neutral variation in rate at which the cone scales develop that leads to this structural diversity of forms that have functionally are very similar to each other. So perhaps one way in which this sort of variation in, in development can lead to morphological diversity is just through these kind of neutral processes, just variation in rate, sort of uh, heterochrony type situation. So now I want to move to uh, the end of ontogeny, so seed dispersal. And here I'll talk about how different cone geometries sort of require, or different cone morphologies sort of require different geometries and mechanical properties to release their seeds. So I talked about how things were open at pollination, but then they close up to protect the seeds, but at some point, they've got to open up again and release those seeds. And the classic way in which pines do this, which pine family does this, is to open up the cone scales, to flex them. That's the way most people think of it. So your typical pine or spruce or hemlock, something like that, you have these woody cones, they will eventually open up and the scales will peel back, and the seeds which are at the base of these scales next to the axis will just kind of fall out. But there are four genera of of uh, pinaceae that we call the shedders here that don't do that. Their cones fall apart at maturity and release the seeds. So uh, firs and cedars have this quite precise mechanism of abscission where the scales just kind of pop off the axis, they fall apart, and the, the seeds which are in between the scales just kind of flutter down the tree. Ketolyria has kind of an imprecise mechanism where the cone basically just rots on the, on the tree trunk and over a couple seasons it just kind of disintegrates and the seeds fall out. Pseudolaryx, one of my favorite trees in the world, one that has a great uh, collection here at the Arnold, basically the cone axis completely degenerates and the scales just fall apart. So there's different mechanisms in which this seems to occur. And the mechanics of this in flexors are well known. It's been studied for, for a while. Basically, each, in a cone scale here, in the ovuliferous scale, this is the Brax obtaining it, you have this thick layer of wood, of xylem tissue, and below that you have a bunch of thickened fibers or scleria tissues. What happens is as this cone dies and dries out, these scleriates basically contract in length, 
which pulls the base of that scale, it shortens it, and it opens the, it flexes the cone scale. It's basically like a, a bimetallic strip, except instead of temperature, you're talking about differences in, um, in humidity or, or uh, in water. And this is totally a passive process. All this tissue is, is dead. In some cases, it's very, very dead. There's a 15 million year old Miocene cone that was uh, lignified that they pulled out and got this thing to work by varying the humidity. Um, and so you have this mechanical situation here that releases the seeds. But what exactly goes on in these shedders? Some of the basic uh, anatomy was known, but we wanted to look at this in a little more detail and see what they were doing. And so we sampled a couple of cones uh, from, we tried to get a lot of Pinaceae species across all the genera, uh, mostly from the Arnold, but from some other botanic gardens as well, if the taxa wasn't present here. And we just sectioned the base of these alveolar for scales uh, in mature cones right before they open. And we also quantified the amount of seed tissue relative to cone scale tissue. And I'll talk about why we did that later. But we basically I took a cross section through the cone and kind of averaged up the, the cross sectional area of seeds versus protective scale tissue. So when you look at flexing ta taxa, their anatomy is what you'd expect if you take a section here through this scale base. You have a fair amount of xylem. It's a little hard to see here. And underneath that is, is a lot of scleria tissue. And the tracheids are, are pretty thick walled with pretty small uh, lumen diameters. And so there's a, a pretty me mechanically tough uh, tracheids here. In shedders, there's quite a bit of variation. So these uh, four taxa down here. Generally, they share uh, sort of a common feature of having not as much xylem. So in pseudolarix, you just have a few, or in abies, you have a few bundles here. In pseudolarix, you have very little. Uh, in cedrus, you have a tiny little bundle. Um, and these tracheids in the xylem tend to be fairly large in, in diameter. So cedrus has these really large tracheids with very thin walls. Um, you tend to have variable scleriids. So some of them have some scleriids below, and some, like pseudolarix, completely lack that. In, in general, ketolaria, which has this kind of intermediate form, or just kind of decays on the tree and gradually falls apart, has an intermediate morphology. It has a fair amount of xylem, but not a whole lot. And the tracheids are a little bit larger than, than your flexors, but, but not uh, that much. So what seems to be happening here is as the cones dry and these things mature, the scleriids, if they're present in these things, contract like they normally would, but not in any particular direction, it would seem. And you have your thin-walled parenchyma cells of the cone base, uh, and the thin-walled xylem cells begin to fracture, and so the things just sort of fall apart. Um, and what we thought was interesting here is that Pinaceae are kind of using this classical trade-off between hydraulics and mechanical properties to, to run the system. So if you want your cones to fall apart, you don't want a lot of vascular, vascular churn. You don't want a lot of thick xylem tissue that keeps them together. But at the same time, you need xylem to get water into your cone as you're developing. So what they do is they just have a little bit of xylem, but they have a little bit of xylem with wide conduits. And that's very good for the conduction of, of water, since the, the conducting ability is uh, scale to the fourth with radius, as I believe is the case. And so they're sort of varying uh, these things. And that's nice for them because they don't have much xylem. And the xylem that they do have is mechanically weak and it's liable to fracture. So that helps the thing fall apart. So it kind of works in this kind of integrated system. But I would say that the total xylem area and what type of xylem they're going to have, whether it's these thin-walled large tracheids or, or, or tough ones, is established fairly early in the development. Right at, it begins right after pollination, when the, when the ovulifer scale is, is maturing. And so the type of anatomy and geometry of the cone scales that they use at this later stage for seed dispersal uh, are established early in the ontogenetic history. So it's something that's kind of pre-building all the way back to right after pollination. And so whatever selective regimes are responsible for these, uh, these two dispersal modes seem to be affecting the entire ontogeny. So what I want to do now is, is give you sort of a concatenated set of, of, I don't know, informed speculations about why this might have arisen. And I'm OK doing that, doing that as a paleontologist, because speculation is sort of a large part of our job. But um, so one thing to notice, though, is there are two major clades of Pinaceae, the pinoids, which includes pines and some other, and larches in the abiotoids, and this sh scale shedding is all concentrated in the abiotoids. So of the abiotoids, the only genus that does uh, this flexing is, is hemlock. So either 
uh, this, this shedding has evolved three to four times in the abiotoids, which it looks sort of likely given the differences in the anatomy between these things. Or it's evolved once at the base of this and was then subsequently uh, lost in suga. It's difficult to, to reconstruct this phylogenetically. There's not a lot of information. Uh, how do you code this character? It's not actually one character. It's not shedding. It's actually a combination of features. So in general, why might the abiotoids show this? Well, the abiotoids in general show typically more seed tissue in their cone uh, than the pinoids do. So if you look at the total cross-sectional area of seeds relative to the total cross-sectional area of the cone as a whole, the abiotoids in squares here generally have more seed tissue in their cone, with the exception of uh, some pinoids that are biotically dispersed, and I'll get to that in a second. But in general, in these abiotoids with large seeds um, that have a lot of seed tissue, they're the ones that are shedding their cone scales. And I think there's a, a simple geometric reason for this. If you are a flexor, you need a fair amount of tissue at the cone scale base in order to make this work. You have to have that large amount of xylem and a large scleria a band in order to make that thing flex. That means you have a bunch of tissue here that's not seeds, and you simply can't pack a whole bunch of really large seeds around the base of this cone. If you do do that, you need a constricted base that fits right between those large seeds and little spaces between them, like something like a fir or a cedar does. And this is more suited uh, to, this, uh, to this shedding mechanism where you have a little bit of, of soft fractable, fractable xylem or whatever uh, that, can, that can break here. And so the packing of high density large seeds is better accommodated uh, by this dispersal mechanism. Just as an aside, one reason that pinoids with biotic dispersal can get away with it is I think many times they don't even want their seeds to be dispersed. So if you have a flexor that's not making these very large spaces for these large seeds to come out, that's okay because typically they want some kind of corvid to come and pull it out with its, be with its beak. They often don't want these seeds to fall on the ground because then squirrels will get them uh, and they're not really dispersal agents for, the, for many of these things. But that's a whole other story. But this doesn't answer the question as to why abiotoids show this. It just says, well, why do abiotoids show a higher fraction of, of seed size in general? And one reason for this might be that abiotoids are characterized by all having this resin vesicles on their seeds. And anecdotally, uh, and I think there's some published studies about this too, squirrels and seed predators tend not to prefer these because they have resin on them. And when they eat them, they get a bunch of crap in their mouth. And so if given the choice, they don't like to eat these seeds is my understanding. And seed predators are known to respond to variations in relative amount of seed tissue. So the harder it is for, things to, for squirrels to get into cones, the more likely they are to choose something else. So what may be the case is because these have unpalatable seeds, they're actually able to pack a higher proportion of seed tissue into their cones, not invest so much in protective tissue, and still get away with doing that. Whereas if they didn't have these unpalatable uh, seeds, they would be high, high priority targets for things like squirrels, things like that. That's a possibility. But we don't know, really. And one thing that might help us understand this is what's going on in, these, in the Cretaceous when a lot of these things were diversifying. Um, and just as an example of, of the direction this could take, uh, Fabiani Herrera, who's a paleobotanist at the Field Museum now, uh, was working on some Mongolian things where they had these what looked like scale shed uh, cone scales. Uh, and inspired by Juan's paper, he looked at the anatomy of these things, which is something you can get out of a fossil record. Uh, and they do indeed have resin canals on their seeds, they have vesicles on their seeds, and they have the anatomy that you suggest, uh, that we suggest you'd find in these scale shedders. There's not a lot of it. It has decently sized uh, tracheids. So maybe further work on the Cretaceous, in which these scale shedding things are quite common, could help us understand the order of these sort of character changes. So just to sum up then, uh, we have these different release mechanisms that are facilitated by different cone geometries, uh, and these are initiated early in ontogeny. So, I just want to end by saying that we have this nice uh, sequence of cone, cone size changes and shape changes. And the only way you can really study this is actually to be in a place like the Arnold or just be able to look at these every day. Because people think that conifer cones are really slow, and some of them are. A couple of pines can take three years to mature. But actually, in the spruce, you have bud break to pollination occurs in about a week. Pollination occurs over a week and a half. Maturation occurs in about a month or so. So by late June, these things are pretty much set. And they're, and they're fully mature, you actually have to get these things pretty rapidly. You can't just do one collection a month to understand the kind of changes that are going on in the structure. Juan had to go out there every single day and make sure that we were getting uh, the right uh, stage of development to capture these changes. So it is really critical uh, to be in a botanic garden to do this kind of stuff. So thanks for having me. Uh, thanks for Ned doubly, both for providing access to all this material and for having me out here. And thanks to a number of other people who, from gardens who provided some, some cone material. Thanks.
first part, you told us all the, in the pollination part of your talk, you said, oh, you know, whether it's the bud scale or the seed scale, it was by chance somewhere in the ants, mm. you said this or that. But if you put in the fossils, could you then make a, 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 you know, a story? There is one pollination stage conifer cone that I know of that's preserved anatomically, just one from the early Cretaceous, 130 or so million years ago. I think it's, they called it Picea, so I believe it has bigger ovuliferous scales at the time of pollination. But in general, that's it. So we have a lot of conifer cones that are mature from the Cretaceous. But because it's transient, it's, a, it's only a small period of their ontogeny, and because it's delicate, uh, to my knowledge, there's only a couple, really only one well-known pollination stage cone. So unfortunately, not really. Um, but maybe, maybe there's more out there. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, w uh, one more question. Yes, sir. Good. Sorry. Uh, I guess I'm very curious about the opening of the cone part. So uh, it looks like the, de uh, the developmental direction is actually changing when it's open. So is that because of the localized or differential growth on the bacteria? bacteria? To some extent, yeah. So I, I didn't talk about this, but what happens is the cone axis elongates. It, it pulls the scales apart, it forces them apart, so there's space between them. And then there's differential growth on the adaxial and abaxial surface that flexes them out. Later, there's differential growth on the abaxial surface that flexes them back close. That was what we were originally looking at, how exactly they do this. But then uh, we also investigated this kind of neat little side story. Yeah. Uh, thanks. There's nothing. By the way, the spruces are going right now. So. <laughs> yeah, they're just opening. <laughs> This is the, let's see, that's the pointer. Right, okay. All right. All right, so um, so I'm in the materials department at MIT, and my research has been on materials with a cellular structure. So some of these are engineering honeycombs and foams for engineering applications. Some of them are medical materials that worked on trabecular bone and tissue engineering scaffolds. But I also work on plants, like medicine. My very first paper was on cork and on the structure and mechanics of cork. And it was fun because one of the things we got to do, I was in Cambridge, England at the time, and one of the things we got to do was go to the Botany Library, and the Botany Library had a first edition of Hooke's Micrographia from 1665, and he has a beautiful drawing of cork, and he has a beautiful quote about um, trying to understand the structure of cork and the properties of cork, and that's really what material scientists do. We like to look at microscopic, mi microscopic structure and relate that to overall properties and I look at mechanical properties. So uh, at one point we had a project on the structure and mechanics of bamboo, and I'm sure you all know this because you're botanists. Uh, bamboo is a tall arborescent grass. There's over a thousand species, and we were interested in what's called timber bamboos. There's a number of species that have very large diameter. Most of our work was done on mosso bamboo. So this is a piece of a mosso bamboo. Should I pass it around? Yes. yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, boys. Uh, so this grows, you know, 20 meters tall, but you have to go 8 inches, 200 millimeters in diameter. It can be harvested every five years. But in particular, one of the things we were interested in was if you have an acre of land, you get more, like, biomass per acre growing bamboo than you do growing wood. And so it grows incredibly quickly. Um, and there's bamboo grows uh, in different places in the world, particularly in Brazil, in India, and China, 
and we were interested in, in developing countries and could you possibly replace uh, sort of structural materials like steel and concrete, which are incredibly energy intensive to, to make. Could you replace those with bamboo and what we call structural bamboo products? So the same way you make um, engineering wood products like plywood and oriented strand board, the idea was to make things like that out of bamboo. And this map just shows some of the distribution of, of bamboo. So traditionally, bamboo has been used in a structural sense, just using the cones, you know, just using the stem itself. And these are just some kind of beautiful examples of traditional use of bamboo. But the thing we were interested in is trying to make structural bamboo products. And I brought some of those to show you, too, because I thought that would be entertaining. So there's an um, oriented strand board. That was made by one of my colleagues at the University of British Columbia, Orson Smith. And that's a laminated bamboo there. And I take that out to remember to show you that later. Um, and so we were interested in trying to make these things and, and understand the properties of bamboo um, and seeing how far we could get with this. So this was a joint project. Uh, at MIT, I was looking at the microscopic structure, what we might call the plant anatomy, and relating that to mechanical properties. Um, and, the, and the preliminary work we did was done with bamboo we got from the Arnold Arboretum. So that was part of the reason Ned invited me. So mostly we worked with the moss of bamboo. But to get some specimens to get started and start figuring out how to cut the specimens and prepare them for microscopy and do some mechanical tests, we got some specimens from the Arboretum, which was, which was wonderful. Um, and my colleague Greg Smith at the University of British Columbia is in a, a wood science department, and he was you know, involved with making um, wood-oriented strand board at one point, and he made the, the bamboo-oriented strand board that I passed around. Uh, the project was also in collaboration with the people at Cambridge University. Michael Ramage is in the architecture department, and he was interested in the laminates and structural testing, so testing you know, great big huge beams, building codes, how you'd have to modify those for bamboo. And we have another colleague, Helen Mulligan, who works at Cambridge Architectural Research, which, which uh, is an architecture firm. They don't really design buildings. They, but they're sort of like a, a research consultancy for architects. So they're interested in energy efficiency of buildings and things like that. And she was working on the thermal performance, the moisture, and the life cycle assessment for these kinds of materials. So that was kind of our project. And what I wanted to talk about today was a little bit about the results from Maso bamboo and comparing the, the native and the oriented strand board and this blue laminated Maso. But I also wanted to talk a little bit about the tree logs because I love doing tree logs. <laughs> and I, I had, I've done a bunch of them, but I, I got some slides for three of the tree logs. One, one of them was on bamboo, but others were on other topics. So the first part is just on the, the structure and mechanics of, of Maso bamboo. And in, in my field, what we want to do is look at the microstructure of something and then look at the properties and try to make some model, some sort of mathematical model that relates the structure to the overall property. So this side over here, we're talking about, um, you'll see when I show you the micrographs of the bamboo, the vascular bundles, but they vary in volume fraction from one side of the cone to the other, of the, of the cone wall. The solid fraction varies, so how much solid you've got is going to affect the properties, so the properties are varying through the thickness of the cone wall. We want to make a mathematical model of the structure. We want to do mechanical tests. Uh, we sort of need some solid, imagine you just had solid material in the cell wall. We need to know what those properties are. Uh, and then we use cellular solids models to kind of represent all this. So I'm not going to go into all the details of the models, but I thought I'd give you a flavor of the kinds of things we were doing. So we looked at the bamboo cone, and the properties vary as you go up the height of the cone from one internode to the next. So this is just kind of defining what the internodes and the nodes are. And then this is a, a scanning electron micrograph of the structure of the bamboo. So if you think of the, the thickness of the column wall, this over here is at the inner, and here's one of the vascular bundles. And then if you scoot over to the outer, this is another vascular bundle here. And you can see if you just look at the vascular bundles, there's a, there's a gradient in the volume fraction of the bundles. There's more bundles over here, but the bundles over here are also denser. So you can imagine the amount of solid stuff we've got is going to affect the mechanical properties. So that's kind of one of the things we wanted to represent was the change in the microstructure from one side to the other, and then how to predict the mechanical properties from that. So we took a bunch of micrographs from this, uh, you know, cross sections and longitudinal sections, just looking at the different um, fibers of the sparenchyma, almost like solid fibers, and the sparenchyma is much 
lower density, and we want to model these two different types of tissue. Uh, first of all, we characterized this radial variation. So this was looking at, um, the, this is the inner part of the comb, and then this is going up to the outer part of the comb. Uh, so this is the radial position as a function of the comb thickness. And this is just looking at the density, and these were three different internodes, so three different sections of different types along the, the bamboo. Uh, and we found the parenchyma volume fraction of solid was, was roughly constant, about 22%. So again, this is just trying to characterize that microstructure. So looking at the, the vascular bundle volume fraction here, and then again for different internodes at different heights, and then as a function of this radial position, and then we get an equation to it. And this is the amount of solid in the vascular bundles as a function of the radial position. And again, this is just a bit equation here. But we're gonna wanna use these things in the models to try to understand the mechanical behavior. So the mechanical testing we did, if you think of this as a comb, we cut some little teeny specimens and we measured some axial compression, so imagine we're kind of loading this way on. We also measured testing in the radial direction here and loading it tangentially this way on. So these are just compression tests in the different directions. And because we're interested in the properties in the different uh, radial positions, we took specimens at different positions in the radial direction here. And then we also cut some longer beams for doing uh, bending tests, for flexure tests. This is so different from the other talks, I've just got to say, it's so different. <laughs> so this is a typical, um, we call it a load deflection curve. You, you apply a load here, and you measure how much your beam deflects or your little axial compression thing deflects. And typically, there's a straight part here. That's the stiffness, or sort of how springy the material is. That's called the mod of elasticity. And then we're also interested in the peak load, which relates to the strength, and in bending, it's called the modulus of rupture. So that's just the kind of measurements we make and then what we want to get out of that. So here's some uh, flexural properties of the bamboo. So this is the axial modulus of elasticity. That's how stiff the, the bamboo is against the density here. And this is how strong it is, the modulus of rupture against the density here. And if you extrapolate, the solid cell wall has a density of about 1,500 kilograms per meter cubed, just similar to wood. Um, you can extrapolate, but the properties, if you kept going, would be, and that would be the solid properties, and that was something that we wanted to have in our model, too. Um, let's see. And so this is now comparing that data with the models we developed. And as I said, we're not going to go into the equations of all the models. But let me just say, the way these models work, uh, this is the Young's modulus, the stiffness in the axial direction, that's what we're applying here, against the density. And this is, this is the density of the parenchyma over the solid density. And, uh, and so this is kind of representing the parenchyma and modeling that as a cell node solid. And this is modeling the sarenchyma, which are solid fibers. And the important thing is if you have a fiber composite, uh, imagine you have carbon fibers in a polymer resin. The, the stiffness just depends on how much of the fibers you've got and their stiffness, and they'll add it on how much of the resin you've got and its stiffness. So this is kind of the same idea, you know, adding on the contribution from the parenchyma with the contribution from the stiff parenchyma fibers. It's the same kind of idea. So we developed a model for this, and the same for the strength. So over here, the this is the modulus of rupture. This symbol here is really just the strength. So again, there's a parenchyma contribution and there's a um, sclerenchyma contribution. So, so part of the project was developing these models. Uh, we also wanted to compare the behavior of the bamboo to wood, and so this plot just shows uh, the mosso bamboo versus some North American softwoods and hardwoods and some tropical hardwoods. So the mas mosso bamboo is a little less stiff to the same density, but it's a little bit stronger, uh, at least to the higher densities. Um, then we also had a little so these are just bits and pieces of different parts of the project. We also did a little comparison of uh, the native MOSO with our engineered products. Mm -hmm. And here's, uh, here's some sort of examples. So this, this is little beams that we cut out of the comb. This is the oriented strand board that I passed around. And these were the tests that Mike, Ra Mike Ramage was doing in Cambridge. So you know these things were two and a half meters long. These were big, big huge beams. Um, and doing structural tests on those. And just to give you some idea here, again, this is the stiffness uh, plotted against density. So this was the natural muscle material 
the blue is the oriented strand board. And you might imagine if, you, if you've got strand board has the you know, little strands in all different directions, if you've got material in all different directions, it's going to be less stiff than if everything's kind of lined up. So not too surprising that it gets a little lower. Um, and then the glue lamb is pretty much the same as the, um, as the natural material. And one of the advantages of glue lamb, just like in wood, is you can cut out defects, you get rid of the nodes, you can kind of control the, the material that you put in. And then this is the strength over here, the bonded structure. And uh, here the engineered products are a little bit worse than the um, natural material. Okay, oh, so now we get to the tree mods. So I think I did a couple of tree mods. One was just on um, looking at the structure of the bamboo, and I brought some micrographs, and I, I brought that comb along with me, and I talked about these sort of traditional um, uh, uh, buildings that were made with comb. And then I did another uh, tree mob uh, that we had done later on, and I, I, I brought this other thing that we made, because I thought this would tickle you. So when we were doing the modeling, one of the things we wanted to do was to, um, to understand how the structure of the, of the parenchyma affected the, the, the properties. And in Selger Solid's modeling, you can model things as a honeycomb, which is sort of prismatic cells all lined up, or you can model them as a foam, which is sort of polyhedral cells that are tibbly tibbly. Uh, and the bamboo, when we looked at it, you know, there weren't, the, the, it wasn't quite a honeycomb, it wasn't quite lined up, but it wasn't quite the foam either. And so Patrick Dixon, the PhD student who worked on this project, he took some pieces of bamboo to the Argonne Lab Synthesis, and he did scans, and X-ray scans, and he did a three-dimensional image, and then he 3D printed on a bigger scale because it's it's very hard to cut out little tiny pieces of parenchyma and do tests on just those. So he he took scans, he 3D printed it, and by 3D printing different densities, we could then get a feeling of was it behaving more like a honeycomb or more like a foam. So this is a little bit sticky, but I don't know. Don't it's the resin. It's, it's still a little bit sticky. Um, actually, I should let me find a tissue and kind of wipe my hands off before I poke into the computer. Um, so, so one uh, tree mob on bamboo was just on the traditional structures, and one I think we went over to the. We always go to where the plants are, so we went to the bamboo. Um, we, um, uh, you know, I, I brought those models and I talked about the modeling of how we did that in a kind of hand waving way. No, no equations, really, but hand-waving way. So that was one tree mob. Um, another tree mob I did was on cattails. I had a project many years ago on iris leaves and how iris leaves mm -hmm. behave mechanically. And these are electron micrographs of the cattail and the iris. And if you look at the iris, you can see this laryngeum in here and here and again on the top. And when you look at an iris leaf and you feel it, you can feel those ribs, and those are this laryngeum. And in engineering, you may be familiar with the idea of an eye beam go to a steel a construction site and have steel beams, they're high beams, and those beams have sort of flanges with a web, and they're very good at resisting bending. By putting material at the top and the bottom, they're very good at resisting bending. I should have brought my little rubber beam. If you, if you bend something, when you bend it like this, it compresses on the top and it stretches on the bottom. And in the middle, it's not stretching or bending. It's not, there's no stretch in the middle. So what you want to do is put most of the material at the top and the bottom where the stretch is rigidity. And one way of doing that is with an eye beam, but another way of doing it is with something called a sandwich beam. And with a sandwich, typically you put fiber reinforced composites at the top and the bottom, and some sort of foamy or honeycomb material in the middle. And that's exactly what the iris leaf does. Those chlorenchyma fibers are like a fiber composite. And we had this paper, and we did all the, you know, I remember I measured like, you know, how big these fibers were, and what bond fraction of fibers we had, and how dense the parenchyma was. We made this whole model of the iris leaf, and you can show that mechanically it behaves like the sandwich beam. Mm -hmm. um, so I did this tree mob, and, and again, you know, I talked about, I showed these pictures. I think we met at the cattails in the marsh by the Hanwell building. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a cattail, I love this picture, because the cattail is almost like I-beams. It's like a whole series of I-beams. You couldn't, you couldn't design something better for bending than these two leaves. It's really, they're beautiful. So I gave a, a, a tree mob on the, on the cattails and iris leaves at one point. And in my department, uh, there's a couple of faculty who are archaeologists, and they looked at how uh, ancient societies made materials. And they run a course called Materials of the Human Experience. 
and usually it has three or four modules on different, on different materials, and the, the different faculty teach it, and talk about how some material was used historically. And for a few years, I gave a section on how woods were used in colonial ships, things like the Constitution. And for instance, they used white oaks in the hull because the oak was denser. They used eastern white pines for the mast because they, they grew very, very tall. And at one point, I did a tree mob. I think you came to it. I did a tree mob on the, on the woods that were used. And I, you know, I brought this picture where you can see the different uh, sort of components of an old wooden ship. And it was fun because we met in the white oaks and we talked about the white oaks being stiff. And then we walked over to the eastern white pines and we looked at how tall and straight they were. And it was, it was kind of entertaining. Uh, and so I wanted to just say, I think as Pam did too, doing the tree mobs is a lot of fun. And uh, I really enjoyed that over the years. So I've done a few different ones for the Arboretum. So that's pretty much my talk. Let me just finish with a couple of other things. I just wanted to acknowledge some people. Uh, Patrick Dixon was the PhD student who did most of the bamboo work. Sardo was a postdoc who worked with me. Uh, and Greg Smith uh, and his students at UBC made the Orange and Strand board. And then there were a number of people at Cambridge uh, as well. And we got funding from the National Science Foundation at MIT from the Natural Sciences and Engineering Re Research Council at UBC and the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council in Cambridge in England. And I guess I, I just wanted to mention, too, how much I love the Arboretum. I live under the Arboretum. <laughs> I live a block from the Arboretum, and I love it. And when Ned asks me to do stuff, I am there. <laughs> <laughs> I am always there. So thank you, Ned. Thank you, Lorna. <laughs>